if you use the bells and whistles right, then that's a good thing. Exactly. Your host, Tim Banal. Hello out there, my friends. This is Tim Banal of BanalofAmerica.com with another edition of Banal of America Audio Season 2. It is October 7th, 2006. Big thanks to all of you who checked out the season premiere last week with Jim Mars. We got a ton of great feedback on it. We build on that momentum from last week with Paul Kimball, Part 1 of 2. Paul Kimball is a documentary filmmaker. He's made several UFO films, including Stanton T. Friedman is Real, Aztec 1948, and Do You Believe in Magic? He's also a very well-known esoteric pundit at the blog The Other Side of Truth. This week, in our first installment, we'll be talking about how Paul got interested in following the UFO phenomenon, how he got into filmmaking, his early films, UFO documentary filmmaking in general, Paul's problems with exopolitics, and his no-holds-barred thoughts on ufology in general. You'll either find yourself frustrated as all hell with him or agreeing with him, but either way, I think you're going to be very interested in what he has to say. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Paul Kimball, let me give you a little bit of background on him. Paul graduated from Acadia University in 1989 with an honors degree in history and political science, and in 1992 from Dalhousie Law School with an LLB. He won multiple scholarships and awards, including the University Medal in History at both Acadia University and the University of Dundee, as well as the CLB Award at Dalhousie Law School. After working for the Nova Scotia Film Development Corporation and Salter Street Films, and as a consultant on film and television to the governments of Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland, Paul founded Red Star Films Limited in 1999. His work as a producer and director since includes documentaries for networks including CBC, Vision, Bravo, SCN, and Space, the Imagination Station, as well as the television series The Classical Now. Paul is a member of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society and the Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. He served as president of the Nova Scotia Film and Television Producers Association from 2002 to 2004 and is currently a member of the Film Advisory Committee for the province of Nova Scotia. His website is redstarfilms.blogspot.com, known to those in the know as The Other Side of Truth. He's also putting on a major symposium in Halifax, Nova Scotia next weekend, October 14th. It's called the New Frontiers Symposium. Paul's going to give us an in-depth preview of that. You can find out more information about the New Frontiers Symposium at halifaxufo.com. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll. This interview was conducted on August 12th, 2006. Paul Kimball, Part 1 of 2, on Banal of America Audio, Season 2. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Banal of America Audio. My guest this week is documentary filmmaker Paul Kimball. He's made a host of films on various esoteric topics like Aztec 1948, Stanton T. Freeman is Real, uh, he's working on Field of Fears and Best Evidence, Top 10 UFO Cases. We're going to talk about all those different films. He has a very prodigious career as a blogger going on right now. His blog is outstanding and amazing. It's called The Other Side of Truth, and you can find that at redstarfilms.blogspot.com, and it is just packed with stuff to read. And he's always discussing ufology and uh, the various inner workings of ufology and some of the infighting and always has something to say about the latest UFO news. So we wanted to get him here on Banal of America Audio to discuss uh, ufology and his films. So, Paul Kimball, welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. Great to be here. Let's start out with your bio, your background, how you came to become interested in ufology and UFOs and and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um. Sure. I should add, too, thanks for uh, mentioning the blog. I should add that on the blog there was a, a list of, uh, you know, which just my opinion, but I put the uh, the 10 people of ufology's generation now, as it were, and uh, coming in at one of those spots was Tim Benal, so, uh, who is changing the way that uh, ufology is looked at, I think, in terms of being a presence on the Internet. So kudos to you. Wanted to say that right off the top. 
and uh, it's a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you. Um, now that I've sucked up to you, uh, <laughs> and uh, you're running me speechless. Yeah, there you go. Well, there. That's the first step. Uh, my work here is done. <laughs> um, how did I get into ufology? Well, I don't actually consider myself in ufology. Um, I don't know if anybody can actually define what ufology is, and that's a, a long topic of conversation maybe for later. Yeah. But in terms of making UFO films it's, uh, or films about UFOs, it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, I started in 2001 with the first film that I had directed. I had I'd produced films before, but I hadn't directed any, and it was Stan T. Friedman is Real. And uh, I wasn't originally going to be the director on that project. There was another filmmaker here in Halifax, Evangelo Cuses, who's a good friend of mine, lives in London uh, in the United Kingdom now. He was originally going to direct it. I had um, produced it, got the financing together, and I was co-writing it. But I sat down with the, the head of one of the funding agencies. Most film projects in Canada are funded by the government in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that person said, well, look, this is really your story. You've been researching it. You've been writing it. Why don't you direct it? And I, I said to him, and he knew me because I had worked for another government film agency prior to becoming uh, leaving for the private sector. So I said to him, well, I can't direct. I don't have a, a film degree or a degree from film school. I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, and I have a history degree, but I don't know how to make films. And he said to me something that stuck with me to this very day, which was basically monkeys can make films. <laughs> um, better if you're a trained monkey, but... As long, and his point was, and he went on at some length about, it, he said, if you, as a director, for documentaries at least, it gets much different if you're making feature films, although yeah. there's still some truth there. Uh, Kevin Costner, when he made Dances with Wolves, went out of his way to credit his cinematographer for, uh, his best director, Oscar, because he said, look, this is the guy that made me look good, because he knew technically how to translate what I wanted to do onto film. Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot of that's true in the documentary realm. I work with very good people. The point of the, the uh, government guy was make sure you surround yourself with people who know what they're doing. Get a good sound man, get a good director of photography, that sort of thing. Yeah. And you need to know the story. And that's what a director for a documentary and a writer, that's what they need to do. They need to know the story. They need to know the people. They need to be invested in it. And with the Stan Friedman film, I was. So I said, eh, okay, fine. And I sat down with Evangelo and said, look, do you mind? And Evangelo said, no, I was going to tell you the same thing myself. And uh, and that's how friends work. So, yeah, that's how I get started in not only UFO films, and I do things um, other than UFO films. Yeah. I've done films on pro wrestling, classical music, um, a slew of stuff. But uh, the first one I ever directed was the Stan Friedman film, which is sort of a UFO film. It happens to be about a guy who has spent his life, or the greater part of it, researching, investigating, speaking about, writing about unidentified flying objects. But it's not a UFO film in the sense that it's really more of a biography of Stan. And it just so happens Stan happens to be a UFO guy. But uh, I really viewed it as a biography, and I think the film, there's a little discussion of things like Roswell and MJ-12, but always in the context of Stan's career. And then I, I went on later, sort of a sequel to that, to do Do You Believe in Magic, a year or two later, for Space up here in Canada, which was specifically about the Majestic 12 documents, and that kind of, I view that as sort of a companion piece to Stan T. Friedman is real, um, because it came out of the Stan Friedman film. So that, that's how I get started in UFO filmmaking, uh, or, well, filmmaking in general, at least in terms of being a director. I owe it all to UFOs. <laughs> but were you, were you like, always sort of interested in UFOs, or, or uh, was it like you picked it up as you uh, got older? Well, my dad had books, you know, Eric Von Daniken books primarily, uh, some things on the Bermuda Triangle. My dad had a, a huge library of books on a, a wide range of subjects, and some of them, a very small amount of them were related tangentially, at least, to UFOs or the esoteric subjects. And so I, I read those as a kid. I've always been interested in UFOs. I mean, it's a fascinating mystery. And that's what sets me apart from the extraterrestrial hypothesis proponents. I still view it as a mystery. So to me, it's an extraterrestrial hypothesis, not an extraterrestrial fact. It's an extra-dimensional hypothesis, not a fact, because we don't know what they are. All that we can say is UFOs as an objective phenomenon, are real. What they are, that's a different story, and there, there are many different theories, but they're just theories. That 
is a mystery. Mysteries intrigue me. There's also a historical aspect to the UFO phenomenon. My background training before I went to law school was in history. Um, and, you know, that kind of thing, you can dig into it. There are there are copious amounts of files. People talk about government documents that you, we can't access, which may or may not exist. Well, there's plenty of government documents that we can access because they do exist. They're online. You can go to the FBI's website. You can go to the CIA's website. You can see some of them. Or you can go to a website like Project Blue Book Archive, um, dot org. I think that's it. I should double check on that. It's uh, Will Wise runs it. Will speaking at my upcoming symposium. Great young ufologist was on the same list that you are, uh, the top ten in, in generation now. And, and the Project Blue Book Archive. If you just type in Project, Project Blue Book Archive, you'll find it. Yeah. Thousands upon thousands of pages of documents um, from the Project Blue Book files. Not all of them are up yet. I mean, it's a very time-consuming task just to get them up there. Oh, sure. Uh, as Brad Sparks pointed out to me once, a lot of these documents have never been looked at. So I'm now doing a film called Best Evidence, Top 10 UFO Cases. And Brad, when I interviewed him in California, said, look, and I was talking to him about some of the cases that will be in the film, and he had a line. He said, look, the best case might be one that we don't even know about yet. They might be sitting in the Blue Book files, for instance, that nobody's really looked at since the day the report was filed, and that needs to be investigated. And I think that might be unlikely, but there's certainly a lot of material there. When people talk about armchair researchers, you don't actually have to go to an archive anymore to look through and at least get a basic understanding of stuff. You can do it online. The trick is to make sure you do it at legitimate places as opposed to not legitimate places. In the Project Blue Book archive, those are the actual documents. So go read through them. If you could get a group of people together and say, look, you take documents, you know, 1 through 28, you take 28 through 50, and read through them, and let's... That would be an interesting project, an interesting online project to take people who are interested in the subject of UFOs and work your way through the Project Blue Book files and find the documents that maybe nobody's looked at yet. Anyway, I don't even remember what the question was, Tim. <laughs> but, it was, uh, 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 so you're saying you sort of always had an interest in UFOs and then uh, as your yeah. filmmaking career got going, there was opportunities to make UFO films, pretty much kind of how it sounds like, right? Yeah, that, that pretty much covers it, I guess. And, you know, I grew up... People sometimes accuse me of standing on the shoulders of giants. It's not true. Uh, but I did grow up with Stan Friedman. He's my uncle. He married into my father's family uh, 30 years ago. So I had more than a passing knowledge and um, appreciation of UFOs from a very young age because I knew Stan. And so every family reunion you'd go to every year, there would be Stan. And I had, I love all my relatives. <laughs> but. Some of them would be talking about evangelical Christianity. Okay, that's intriguing. Others would be talking about baseball. I'd always make sure to get in on that conversation. But there's the guy. He's over there. He's talking about UFOs. Well, now, that's that's different. That's a little weird. Um, so that's a guy that naturally uh, I would be interested in because he's he's very intelligent, or he, he was. He came across as very intelligent, still is. He was very committed. He knew his stuff. And he was, as anyone who's met Stan knows, he's a very interesting, accessible guy, Um, whether you're a relative of his or not. He's the kind of guy that you can talk to very quickly. He's just a nice man. Yeah. So he was a nice guy to talk to. Um, And I'm not going to say that family reunions were boring. They weren't. But if you're there for 12 hours during the day, (laughs) it just makes sense that eventually you'd wind up with Stan. And after the first couple of times I talked to him, as I get older, you know, when I'm 10 and 11, what kind of conversation could you have? Yeah. Ooh, things in the sky. But, you know, in the late teens and early 20s, I talked to him a bit more uh, in depth. And uh, and Stan's a guy, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, and over the years I've come to disagree with him on a number of subjects, he's always got something to say, and he always makes you think. And he generally respects your opinion, whether you agree with him or not. So that's the kind of guy that you know, Stan's, Stan's been there for 50 years doing it, and I think there's a lot more people than me that have become interested in the subject of UFOs because of Stan Friedman than perhaps anyone else still breathing today. Oh, I think that might be his, his ultimate legacy or epitaph is I've seen him at college lectures in front of two or 300 people, and whether they agree with him or not, people will walk out and they're talking, and that's, that's a very important thing. He, he brings that to the table. I think that's probably his greatest contribution to the study of the UFO phenomenon is just getting people interested in the subject. And I'm one of those people. So there you go. 
Oh, definitely. Uh, I was just going to say, um, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 80s, and, and I, I grew up in uh, sort of seeing Stan Freeman on all kinds of stuff, so I, he always has sort of a, like a pop culture, almost like a celebrity-like status to me, in a sense, just because he's, as I grew up and, and got into ufology, he was always like the guy you'd see on TV and stuff, so I can totally identify with, with what you mean by that. Sure, it's interesting. He went to university with Carl Sagan. They were classmates for a while. And Carl Sagan was the great popularizer of the second half of the 20th century of science, much to the chagrin of many of his colleagues um, in the scientific community. I would say Stan is the great popularizer of the UFO phenomenon in the second half of the 20th century. Guys like Donald Kehoe certainly had a role to play. Um, J. Allen Hynek, absolutely. But in terms of just the impact he's had and the number of people he's reached, for good or ill, and in, in sometimes it's ill and sometimes it's good, but just in terms of the number of people he's interested, Stan, you know, Stan is the Sagan of ufology, if you want to put it like that. And I mean that, and I know a lot of people in ufology aren't terribly <laughs> fond of Carl Sagan, yeah. but I mean that in the best possible way, in the sense of the impact he's had. And whatever you, you might think about Sagan, and I'm a big fan of Sagan's in general, um, the impact he had on getting people interested in science was huge. And I think Stan's had that kind of impact, perhaps on a smaller degree, just because ufology is a smaller, more particular field. But within ufology, and leaving ufology aside even, just the UFO phenomenon in general, I think Sagan, or Sagan, Stan is the Sagan of UFOs. And, and that's, a, that's a good thing. That might be the highest compliment I can pay to him um, in terms of what he's done over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and kind of talk a little bit about your movie there, Stan T. Freeman is real. Uh, it kind of what the way you described it, it really is what I like the most about it is that it's more about a person than really the UFO phenomenon. And, and I thought that that made it stand out from like so many other UFO type documentaries. I mean, it's really one of a kind in a lot of ways as far as movies about the UFO phenomenon go. And I'm really, particularly the scene where he's in the hotel and he's talking about how uh, he's in town for a lecture or something, and he has to do a bunch of radio interviews, and then he's going to a school, and sort of like really uh, gives you a behind-the-scenes look of what it's like to be a UFO researcher, especially Stan Friedman, who's such a huge name. So I, I doff my cap to you as far as that goes in the film. Well, thanks. He, he's a fascinating subject for any documentary maker, leave aside the UFO thing. Yeah. Um, and I spent, after I left law school, I went and started playing in, well, I'd already played in bands, but I went into the music industry as a musician for about six or seven years. And same thing is true. People look at musicians. I'm no John Lennon or Paul McCartney, obviously, but people would always say, well, what a glamorous life you lead. You get to travel, you get to tour, meaning those guys, not me. Yeah. Um, I got some small taste of that in the music industry, and it's not nearly as glamorous as as you would think it is. Certainly not when you're at the lower levels, but even when you get to the top. You know, one of the reasons the Beatles stopped touring in the mid-60s is it was just such a grind. Yeah. And while it might look glamorous to us, it wasn't. Stan's the same way, and that's one of the things you have to respect about him. He sometimes gets criticized by people who accuse him of being a bit of a promoter or a huckster or going out and doing all these lectures just for money, blah, blah, blah. And I say good on him because I don't think the people that necessarily criticize him, and when I say good on him, I mean good on him for getting paid, realize what's involved in all of that. And I think that's one of the things that I liked in the film the most, as you say, that came out just the grind of Stanton T. Friedman's existence over the last 40 or 50 years, touring, lecturing, speaking. Yeah. And yes, he gets paid to do it most of the time. Uh, but so what? Big deal. He should get paid, frankly. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't expect you 2 to tour uh, for free. So, and I'm not saying Stan's the equivalent of you 2 but the principle is the same. And it's true. You know, you sit in it. Same thing with filmmaking. People say, oh, wowee. You know, I have friends from law school, and they go, wowee, you're making films. How glamorous. And I go, yes, and you're making five times as much money as I am, which I should yeah. be making now. And, you know, they go to travel, and I go, well, yeah, you know. Sometimes. Yeah. Other times, it's you're two days in this town, hopping on a plane, going next, you're one day in this town, then three days in this town, boing, 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 boing. And it's very much the Stan Friedman kind of thing. And it's it's nice for a while. But this last trip I was on for uh, Best Evidence, where did we go? We flew to Kansas City to interview Mac Tonys. We were there for two days. Flew to Dallas to interview a witness one day. Los Angeles, we were there in the Los Angeles area for four days interviewing Brad Sparks and a couple other people. Back to Washington, drove 
all over the D.C., Virginia, Maryland area to pick up three interviews and then hopped on a plane and got home. And by the end of it, I was just thinking, you know, maybe I'll just take a break from directing for two or three years after these films are over. And I have one more that I start in September on classical music because a lot of this travel, uh, yeah, it's not as glamorous. You know, I'm not whining or complaining. It, it is fun, but it is. It's a bit of a grind. Yeah. And Stan's been doing that for 40 years on and off. So, you know, kudos to him and anyone who can criticizes him for, for getting paid for doing that should have their head examined because they, you know, walk a mile in his shoes. And yeah. so I was glad the film, I thought that was one of the more poignant moments in the film. And uh, I was glad to have an opportunity to stick that in there because um, that's what his life's been. And it's been hard on him, I think, at times. And, uh, you know, on his family, too, uh, because he's away for, for prolonged periods of time. So on my aunt and my cousin, his daughter, and, uh, you know, that's what he's been doing. Good for him. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure it must be equally grinding to have to answer, like, the same sort of questions every time you uh, talk to people, which he's probably had to do for, like, the last 20 years. Well, in a sense, it is very much like the music industry, because as you tour, you hit every town, you do a radio show. The Simpsons parodied this once. I think it was Spinal Tap came into town or somebody. Yeah. So the guys from the radio station were interviewing them and, and saying, can you say that, you know, KCLY or whatever is, is the greatest station in Springfield or something? Says, oh, no, we can't, can't really say that because we haven't heard the other stations. Well, can you say KCLY rocks out? Well, I guess we could say that. Sure, why not? <laughs> it's just like, and to, for Stan, to say every town you'd go in, to say, every radio station would yet ask, get you to ask the same thing. And it's true for Stan. Every lecture you would do, you know, probably the same questions are going to come up, and maybe some different questions. But usually, there's a core group of questions that are probably going to come up, and somebody's going to ask him that. And so he's answering those same questions over and over and over and over again. And that it's. It's like playing the same song over and over and over again. You know, it's fun for a while, but when you've played your your song for the 15th straight time, well, <laughs> maybe the song, maybe it's not quite the same song anymore. So, yeah, it's all, it's a bit of a grind. And, uh, and like I said, kudos to Stan for putting up with it for so long. And uh, kind of segueing from there into uh, just UFO documentaries in general, because like I said, the, the Stan T. Friedman movies are so different from a lot of the other UFO-type documentaries. What do you think of um, – now, I'll be honest. I haven't seen your uh, stuff yet. You're working on a lot of stuff that's just due to be coming out soon anyway. I haven't seen Aztec 1948 yet, so I can't really speak to that. But – uh, what do you think of UFO documentaries in general? As you're you're a filmmaker, so I'm sure you've seen a bunch of them. And, and what do you think of of that genre of documentaries? The vast majority of them are pure, unadulterated crap, um, and I'll make no bones about that. There are exceptions that prove the rule. Um, maybe some of my films are part of those exceptions, and maybe they're not. I don't know. It depends on the viewer. But I'm well aware of the flaws sometimes within my own films, and I appreciate. I got panned once in the National Post for Do You Believe in Magic? It was lovely. There's a, the National Post is one of Canada's two major national newspapers. The Globe and Mail is the other, both out of Toronto. And so I opened up the National Post one day, uh, about two years ago, I guess, and there in the entertainment section on the front page was a giant picture of me and <laughs> my director of photography, Tarek Abu Amin, on that particular project, you know, staring into a camera. And then this two third page article and I thought, Wowee, this is you know, this yeah. you can't buy this kind of publicity. I didn't even ask for this. I guess the network sent them the film or whatever. Then the guy proceeded to trash the film point by point. You know, he at one point he he called it the worst thing you can say about a film. You can hate the film. You can go, I disagree with that completely and often yeah. that's said about say Michael Moore's films, for instance, mm -hmm. depending on which side of the fence you're on. But the one thing you, you can't deny about Michael Moore is he makes interesting films. So whether you love them or hate them, they're, they're, they're engaging. Anyway, this guy, this reviewer said, do you believe in magic is visually boring for a filmmaker? Like that's death. Yeah. And I, and the reason he thought it was visually boring was because it was a lot of talking heads and a lot of documents. And it's a film about Majestic 12. I'm sorry. Yeah. Documents that the, they are documents. The odd thing is he comes and people, this is where I sit betwixt and between, and I've, I've read, say, on UFO updates, or people always criticizing the media, especially people who make UFO documentaries. I mean, I just did it. I called most of them un unadulterated crap, and I'll explain that in a second. But I do it for different reasons than they do it. They do it often, and they say, look, they sensationalize stuff. Okay, that's one of my criticisms, too. But they say they don't really get it. They don't really take it seriously. Um, 
And then the, I've had people look at my films and they'll say, well, do you believe in magic? So it seriously. We have just ufologists, which is basically what it is. Ufologists talking and documents. They're the documents for good or ill. There yeah. it is. Well, great. But do you know what percentage of the audience ufologists and people interested in ufology are? <laughs> you know, it's pretty small. Yeah. There's the entertainment reporter or whatever he was for the National Post slamming my film for being visually boring. That's the path that anyone who's making UFO films or films about any subject, really, but let's just talk UFOs. That's where you have to walk because I'm sorry, it's a business. At the end of the day, my car payment, my, my, any payment I have on my massive debts and credit cards, that's what I do. I make films. So I have to make interesting films that are going to appeal to people beyond just the narrow confines of ufology. Mm-hmm. The trick is, and I think I've been able to do it so far, is to make films that are going to appeal to both groups, notwithstanding that one critic in the National Post who said it was visually boring. He also said, though, he found the, the material somewhat interesting, the sort of back and forth um, between the ufologists, particularly Stan Friedman and the, the late Carl Flock, mm-hmm. who are the two primaries in the film. He said, look, he found the minutiae of it kind of interesting from a sociological point of view. Not He didn't care about the material, really, but he said, look, okay, that's interesting. It's just visually boring. And I took to heart what he said, and I said, okay, I can probably make it more interesting next time by having a few fewer talking heads and maybe some more stuff going on. And in that film, it was primarily the low budget I had to work with that was driving the fact that, you know, talking heads and documents and not a lot else because things cost money yeah. to make films. But there is a middle ground. I think people in ufology don't always appreciate it when they go after uh, filmmakers or producers or television networks for the kind of programming they are. They don't appreciate that at the end of the day, it is entertainment as much as information. There's nothing wrong with that. That is the nature of television. It's, it's meant to entertain, and if you can inform at the same time, that's a bonus. But in a one-hour-long documentary about any subject, which is usually what it is for television, you're not going to be able to solve all the world's problems. So yeah. if your documentary is about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and it's an hour long, I guarantee you it's not going to solve the problem. If it's about UFOs and it's an hour long, I guarantee you it's not going to solve the problem. What it might do, though, is interest people to look at the problem more closely using other resources, libraries, um, whether you find them on the Internet or not, uh, all the various resources that are out there. So documentaries, to me, at least the hour-long kind, even Michael Moore's films, which are theatrical length in that they're 80, 90, 100 minutes long, Michael Moore can't solve all the problems. I don't think he solved any of them. I think he just makes them worse. But even if <laughs> even if you agree with Michael Moore, you, he can't solve the problems. All he can do is encourage people to do something, either become active or look into it more or whatever. That's what a good documentary will do. Much like a Stan Friedman lecture, it will interest you in the subject and encourage you to go out and do your own research. Bingo. However, here's a good example of this. And so, sorry to ramble on. No, it's all right. Uh, best evidence, top 10 UFO cases. It's uh, 48 minutes long, which is an hour for television here in Canada. Mm-hmm. In 48 minutes, there is no way on God's green earth you can do one UFO case properly, like yeah. the really good ones, which have reams of evidence and documents and radar reports and witnesses and all of that sort of stuff. You can't even really do one in depth. That's a book. That's yeah. what books are for. Yeah. Trying to do 10, like I made no bones about it. You're not going to get an in-depth report on what these 10 these 10 cases are. Yeah. But because the process of choosing the 10 cases was I went to the people most knowledgeable about all cases, namely leading ufologists, and asked them to rank their top 10 cases and conducted a poll that way and then factored all the results in and spit out a, a top 10 list. That's what gives it its legitimacy and makes it different than anything else I think that's ever been done. I don't think there's ever been a documentary uh, done like that. Yeah. And so there are 10 cases. Great. Here's case number five. You get four minutes on it. Do, 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 do. <laughs> it's basically just the highlights. But if you go, wow, that sounded interesting, fine. Go read Joe Blow's book on it or yeah. check it on the Internet or yeah. whatever. And if it encourages people to go do that, that's what it's meant to do, as well as entertain. So there'll be animation and, and some cool stuff. Almost every ufologist was fine with that. Nobody, re- You know, like, fine. There were a couple. I won't name them, but there were a couple, and they know who they are, who said, well, this, this is useless. This, you know, this, this will accomplish nothing. This is a horrible, and the stuffy types, it's a horrible exercise. It's not serious, blah, blah, blah. To which, 
Let's see. Are you on real radio? No. Sorry. No offense, but you're on the internet, so I can say whatever I want. Yeah, I? yeah you can say whatever you want. Fine. Fuck them. That's <laughs> what I would say to them. They are the kind of people who hold the serious study of ufology back. There are many different types of people who hold the serious study of ufology back, but they're in one group over there. And they're so full of themselves and their egos and just their unwillingness to view anything, ironically, outside their own little box. And a lot of it is to do with ego, Tim. Mm-hmm. That they just, they look and they say, well, top 10, it's not going to accomplish anything. Well, no, it's not going to accomplish anything like, you know, the way you've been trying to accomplish something for 30 years, which is, what have you accomplished exactly? Nothing. How many people maybe have read your books? I don't know, what, a thousand, two thousand? But what it might accomplish in time to broaden your horizons is it might get people interested in the subject or in these cases that they've never heard of. I went on Coast to Coast. I mentioned one of the cases, RB47. I got over two dozen emails from people listening to the episode that said they've never heard of that case. Well, it's one of the best cases ever. If you want to talk to a debunker and say, look, here's proof of the objective reality of the UFO phenomenon, RB47 should be the first one or one of the first ones you should trot out. Yep. So, but no, that would be horrible. You know, just a brief mention on Coast to Coast, God forbid, or a, a four-minute segment in a documentary, well, it's not going to do any good. Eh, well, screw them, yeah. is all I can say. They're better off not participating, because if you have that kind of mindset, I don't think you're bringing anything to the table anyway. And Stan has run across that kind of stuff, too. People who will somehow, sometimes not understand what he's out there trying to accomplish when he gives lectures, and maybe goes to conferences where maybe some of the speakers are a little goofy, a little wacky. Well, Stan's out there, and he's still making his case. And if he can reach people in the audience, um, that's good. And there, there probably is one or two conferences Stan's gone to where maybe everybody else is goofy and wacky, and okay, maybe he shouldn't have gone to that one. But Stan's argument has always been, look, I'm out there, I'm making my case, and in 60 minutes or 90 minutes, whatever I have to speak, and hopefully encouraging people to take the serious avenue and go look at the serious stuff. And that's the same thing that Best Evidence is designed to do, and I make no pretensions otherwise that it's, it's going to be there to solve the problem. You've explained what makes a good UFO documentary, but what then what, Then explain why, you know, what's, what makes the ones that are out there now crap, because I, I agree with you in a lot of ways that most of the stuff I see on basic cable nowadays, as far as UFO documentaries, are formulaic and just awful, and I really don't watch them anymore. Um, so what you know what 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 do you think uh, makes them crap? Well, I think the word you just used, formulaic, is perfect. Um, you hit the nail right on the head there, because they are formulaic. They generally follow a formula, and and pop songs do too. It's you know somebody told me once, make sure every pop song is A B A B C A B. You know, um, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, or yeah. middle eight, uh, verse, chorus, and out. That's the three minute pop song. Well, documentaries have the same sort of, um, well, any story does beginning, middle, and end, but mm-hmm. there's different ways of looking at it. Within that formula, though, you don't have to be formulaic, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And to me, here's the worst example of formulaic. So many UFO documentaries rely on stock footage. I have never used, now I'm not saying that I won't ever use it, but if I do, I can guarantee you it'll be related to the particular subject being talked about on the screen. I've never used stock footage, ever. You know, the stereotypical shot of the atomic bomb exploding. That's that's one of my favorites. You can tune in to any one of a number of UFO documentaries, and you'll see somebody talking about... um, Oh, I don't know. I can't re- What would the voiceover be? UFOs have been visiting Earth since 1947. And meanwhile, you know, there's the atomic bomb exploding. The same shot. Everyone's seen it in like 50 different documentaries. But there it is because it's easy. Yeah. And it's it, people, you know, it's insulting to the audience. Because, and I, I'm when I'm not making films, I am in the audience. And I sit there and I go, I'm insulted. Mm-hmm. Like you're using the same freaking shot that everybody else has used. At least you could get a shot of a different atomic explosion, (laughs) maybe one in the ocean or something. But try something different, and I know why they do it. They do it because it's familiar and because people already recognize it. It's easier to just do things that, you know, hallmarks, bing, bing, bing. People will recognize that and that and that and that. Well, none of that challenges the viewer. And like I said, I don't like Michael Moore. I don't like his films. I don't agree with them. Um, But... I go see them, and they're challenging, and it gets me thinking, usually disagreeing with them, although not always, but usually disagreeing with them, but it gets me thinking. And so many UFO documentaries, so whatever Michael Moore's ills are, that's not one of them. He's challenging. He's out there, you know, putting it out to people. UFO documentaries, by and large, don't do that. They settle for what's easy. 
They settle for the same formula that most people have used, and they settle, what's worse for a filmmaker, is they settle for the same shot. They rely on stock footage as opposed to going out and shooting new footage or as opposed to interviews They're, because they seem to be afraid of the talking head syndrome, which is what the National Post criticized me for, mm -hmm. too many talking heads. And, you know, there, you know there's a fine line <laughs> between the two. Yeah. But if you ask people, I've always believed that if you have an interesting subject, I think UFOs are interesting. I think most people would probably agree with that, even if they think it's bunk. And you have interesting people. So let's say Stan Friedman, Kevin Randall, um, Dick Hall, those are all interesting people who have interesting things to say. Well, then I don't mind talking heads. Yeah, I'd like to see it broken up every now and then by a, maybe a photo or something, but I, I don't need to see three seconds of a, the talking head followed by 25 seconds of uh, exploding atomic bombs while their voice still goes. Yeah. I'd rather see 28 seconds of the talking head so I can get the measure of the man, as it were. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's a complicated question. With It's just one of those things that people say, do you like that painting? Well, I don't know much about art, but I, I know what I don't like when I see it. <laughs> and I actually know something about filmmaking, but I would have the same response. I know what I like, and I know what I don't like. And the reason is always, it's boring. And unlike the National Post guy who said mine was visually boring, I would say it's just boring. It's yeah. boring content. It, they've what, And often what they'll try and do is create this broad brush. Um, and say, you know, like, give the, the overview, but they don't do it very well. Instead of focusing in maybe on certain particulars that would be much more interesting to the viewer, they just, the same old cliches and bromides and everything else tossed out there. Um, and uh, that's the problem. So, you know, and, and, and I can go out and make a film like Best Evidence, but it'll be punchy. And I know what the film's for. It's designed to, you know, quick little snippets that'll get people interested. The problem with these films, so it's a general film in a sense, obviously. The problem with these films when they're general is they're general and they're so generally boring that they don't get anyone interested in the subject. People tend to tune out. Yeah. And it should tell you something when people who are interested in the subject of UFOs are tuning out, not just the general audience, but exactly. the people who are interested in the subject. You want to see a well-made UFO documentary? Peter Jennings, uh, Seeing is Believing. I'm not talking about the content now. That People can argue about that. Yeah. I'm just talking about the quality of the filmmaking. Now, they have a huge budget that I wish, you know, I can go through a year with three films and not get that kind of budget. But that you can still do that on smaller budgets. And that is that was a good film, especially the first hour, which was riveting. It was a in the sense that it was a lovely mixture of talking heads, as it were, real people, but also images, images that were related to what the people were saying. Yeah. As well as animation, new stuff. I mean it was all really put together, especially in the first hour, really well. The second hour, when they focused in specifically on Roswell and alien abductions, not so good. Um, whether you agree or disagree with what they were saying, the film started to drag because it became more polemical. Um, but the first hour was just, if they had left it at one hour, it was ripping. You know, it was great. That's yeah. good filmmaking. And uh, he should be commended, well, posthumously, I guess, he should have been commended for that. So, you know, good films, bad films. Um, the vast majority of them, though, are are lousy lousy films. And in some cases, last comment on this, Tim, some cases, to be fair, that has something to do with the, the budget. Yeah, I was um, just going to ask you that. Uh, what do you think the reasoning is behind why they, more often than not, the films are, are pretty lousy? I think a fair amount of it is budget. And if uh, any broadcasters that I work for are listening to this, I'm not complaining about you. You've always <laughs> been very generous and kind to me. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Although you could be more generous and more kind if you wanted to. Um, a lot of it's the budget, and a lot of it is, and leaving aside television, for instance, because UFO documentaries go far beyond what you'll see on television. If you go to conferences, you'll realize oh. that there are films out there that are never going to make it in television because whatever you think of television documentaries, the quality of the film of these other ones, is it's meant for direct sale. Yeah. And so many people go to conferences. Uh, I saw them at Laughlin this year when I went to the UFO Congress, and they buy these films. And I don't blame the distributor. Uh, in this case, Tim Crawford from UFO TV. It's his job just to sell these films. Great. In fact, he's distributing. We just signed up. He's distrib distributing. Do you believe in magic for us? I just delivered two hours worth of bonus materials to him. And Tim's a great guy, and he's got a wide range of films. Some of which are good. Um, the majority of which are probably not so good. But that has to do with who who's going out and making these films. And this is. I had a tete-a-tete -tete with somebody once uh, on UFO updates about this. I think. 
you know, the, the basic gist of what they were saying is, look, let's all grab cameras and we can all go out and make UFO documentaries. Oh, no. To which I <laughs> sort of said in the politest way I could, but I'll be less polite now, um, bollocks. You know, that that is one of the most insulting things you can say. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have a film degree, but I've done it, I've trained myself through experience. And I also know enough to hire people who do have film degrees or 25 or 30 years of experience to do all the technical stuff to make sure that my ideas get translated properly. Mm-hmm. Fine. What the, That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about going out with their own camera, and I've seen people at conferences doing this, just sitting down with a camera and interviewing a guy with a microphone. And suddenly that's going to be a UFO documentary. That's what causes real problems because it, it sort of, you're only as good as your lowest common denominator, mm-hmm. no matter what it is you're doing. And in terms of filmmaking, these people are the lowest common denominators. They're not even filmmakers, really, but they pretend they are. And a lot of people buy these films, and they go, whoa, whoa, UFO documentary, wow, that, that sucks. So they're not going to buy other UFO films. They yeah. get turned off. I've heard this from people. Mm-hmm. And I said, look, you have to differentiate between films that are made by amateurs, which you should avoid, unless it's a subject that really, really, really interests you, and then maybe the subject's worthwhile. And there's always one amateur out of 100 that, the exception that proves the rule, they'll make a good film, um, relatively good, no matter what. You know, and stick with the ones that are made by professionals. Because if you were going to sell your house, you wouldn't hire the carpenter to sell your house for you, I would hope. Yeah. You'd hire a real estate agent and a lawyer, a lawyer to make sure that the, the property was, you know, you, so you didn't get a nasty surprise about an easement or something. Yeah. Some guy starts driving his truck through your yard every day. What? Well, I have an easement. Yeah. You didn't know? Well, no, we hired the carpenter to do the uh, the legal work. Oh, well, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll see you in court and you'll lose. You're, if you're charged with murder, I would assume you're not going to go out and hire uh, the amazing Randy to defend you at your trial. <laughs> yeah. Probably not a good idea. Conversely, if you want to build a nuclear weapon, my advice to you would be to get a physicist, you know, a nuclear physicist to do it, people who know what they're talking about, as opposed to the guy serving you French fries at McDonald's. Anyway, the point is, there is a sort of level of professional competence that is required to do anything, and filmmaking is no different. And I think that's part of the problem with a lot of the non televised documentaries, the ones that are just made for direct sale. Mm-hmm. And they they are of a qualitative level that is even lower than, say, the bad ones that might be on television. Now, as I said, what you will sometimes find is one of the, quali- the, the amateur films will actually be better than most of the made-for-television ones because the person who did it, amateur though they might be, actually cared about the subject, took the time to learn about the basics of filmmaking at least, and managed to turn out a project that's interesting, even if maybe the, it's not polished, quite as polished yeah. as the mainstream one. And that's the same thing as going to music and saying, well, that artist didn't record in a recording studio. He did it on a four-track or an eight-track in his house. But the music is so good, and they're so good, that it, it sort of makes up for the fact that the recording quality isn't as good as, say, something that would be coming out of a 24 or 32 track studio or whatever. Yeah. That happens sometimes, but, you know, what I would rather see is that person with their four track in a 32 track studio with a good producer and, and making the most out of the music. But that, you know, the opportunity for that to happen doesn't always come about. Uh, I think I just rambled again. I'll, you'll hear that a lot, folks, in this, in uh-huh. this call. I'm rambling, sorry. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the budget, even for real filmmakers who are out there, you know, the professionals. But I think an awful lot of it has to do, in the bad ones in their case, they just don't, you know, to them it's just another project. Yeah. And so they make that one, and then they're going to move on and make the next one, and that's fine. And, yeah, it's a business, so that's the way it goes. You sell one car, you move on to sell another car. On the bottom end of it, I think there's just so many people out there who don't have a clue what they're doing, and it just sours the market for those people who do know what they're doing. Yeah. And I, that's unfortunate. Now, let's talk a little bit about the movie you made, Aztec 1948, and then uh, from from the looks of things on your blog, it doesn't sound like you were too enthused with uh, the Aztec story, so maybe you can tell us about how how that came about also. Oh, well, let's see. Do I tell Tim and his listeners the truth, or I tell them the not truth? Ah, what the heck, I'll go for the truth. Um, the truth about it is, Tim, look, I'll be perfectly honest, I was making Do You Believe in Magic for television up here in Canada. Yeah. And the conference, there was a conference going on in Aztec, New Mexico, that had an awful lot of people, Carl Flock, Stan Friedman, uh, who else, Rob Swiatek, Bruce McAbee, John Greenwald, people that I wanted, you know, thought would, these would be good people to interview. Yeah. So, 
instead of flying or driving to all of their various locations, hit them in one spot. Yeah. But I'll make no bones about it. The budget for Do You Believe in Magic was very, relatively speaking, small. It was tight. And so getting out to Aztec was problematic. Like, we were we were really tight on that budget. No bones about it. Mm-hmm. Anywho, I was talking to Stan Friedman one day about this, because obviously he was being interviewed for the film. And Stan said, look, I know this guy, Scott Ramsey. He's looking into the Aztec case. I had never heard of the Aztec case. Um, in fact, up to this point, I, I really wasn't taking uh, much of an interest in ufology other than having made Stan T. Friedman that's real and read a few books. Mm-hmm. Some people don't believe that when I say, they, oh, Paul must have been interested in UFOs, you know, and listening to Jeff Rents or Coast to Coast every day. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was watching baseball games and other things. Still do. So, anywho, Stan said, look, call Scott Ramsey. He's a good guy. And Scott's been looking for someone to make a film about the Aztec case. And he seems to have investors down there. Maybe, you know, you can combine the two. Anyway, long story short, that's what I did. I called Ramsey. Turns out he had 13 or 14 guys down uh, that he knew in North Carolina willing to put about a grand each into the Aztec film. I literally said, fine, give me that money. I'll kill two birds with one stone. That got us out to Aztec. I um, I convinced the crew to work for a lot less money than they usually would on a per-day basis, which is you can get away with when you're working with friends and they sort of all buy into the project idea. Yeah. So we stuck around in Aztec for about an extra week and a half and did the film. You know, we did both. Mm-hmm. So I shot the interviews I needed. So Carl Flock and I sat down. I interviewed Carl for about 50 minutes on Majestic 12. We took a coffee break for 10 minutes. We turned the camera back on. I interviewed him for another 50 minutes on... Um, yeah. On Aztec, because yeah. Carl Carl was a guy who had studied Aztec. Yeah. And uh, I got comment, you know, same thing, Stan. I did the interview for Stan, uh, Majestic 12, much longer, three or four hours, and then I did about a 20-minute snippet on the Aztec case. Mm-hmm. So so that's really, I mean, I had no great burning desire to do a film about Aztec, but I did it. Uh, and I suppose you could say I did it for the money, in that I needed the money to help me make another film. Welcome to my world. Yeah. However, once I started doing it, I realized a couple of things. One, Scott Ramsey is a nice guy. And Scott, although I disagree with his conclusions 100%, Scott had done an awful lot of research. Absolutely. So, that, you know, I respect him for that. And I said, well, okay, this is a guy I can work with. You know, money or no money, if Scott had come to me and said, look, I'm a crazy guy, woo, 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 and uh, he had sound completely wacky to me, I would have said, well, no, fine, you know, I don't need the money that much. I do have standards. Yeah. But he, you know, and then I looked into Aztec and I said, look, um, this seems like a case. It's obvious. It is one of the classic cases of all time in, for, for ill, in my view, but, you know, it's just a major case. Mm-hmm. I think it's all bunk. But it's a major case. In, in fact, Frank Scully's book, Behind the Flying Saucers, was hugely influential, for good or ill, in the early 1950s. Aztec, um, because of the mess that came out of Aztec, soured people on the whole idea of crash flying saucers for almost 25 years, until yeah. Roswell wandered along. Uh, the subject of crash flying saucers was, if not quite verboten, um, then more or less verboten. Yeah. Whatever German for pretty much verboten would be, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so... You know, it was, it's a, it was a good case to make a film about. It, it wasn't a case where I was offering, in some films I will and some films I won't. I did a film on Denise Jokic where a lot of my personal opinions, she's a classical cellist in Canada, mm-hmm. a lot of my own personal opinion uh, came in in the, the narration. In Aztec, it didn't. I said, look, I'm just going to, here, Scott Ramsey, you present your side of the case. Carl Flock, who was the major skeptic, you present your side of the case. And here's, you know, the evidence that, that you viewers can judge for yourselves. Um, and fine. So I made the film. There it goes. I did a couple of things to promote it. Uh, I went and spoke at Ryan Wood's conference and uh, delivered a very short paper just saying, look, here's the Aztec case. I did Coast to Coast with um, Linda Moulton Howe and George Nori. Talked a bit about it. Yep. Uh, actually, I didn't do a lot of talking. Linda Moulton Howe asked the questions and then answered them as well. So, Paul, <laughs> you know, you, you believe in Aztec. Well, of course you do. Pardon? Excuse me? Wait, you know, well, yeah. as you're sitting down with Linda Moulton Howe, you realize very quickly, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you don't get a whole lot of words in edgewise, and that's fine. So, uh, and much to my chagrin, I did the Jeff Rents show, which has been a source of some controversy ever since. Um, you know, I got referred to Rents by uh, Nick Redfern. and apparently Rents wanted me to come on and do the show, and, and uh, I said fine, and I'd never heard of the guy before, so I went on, plugged the Aztec film, and uh, have regretted being on the Rents show ever since. Fair enough, whatever. But uh, that was Aztec, and so when I started doing my blog, 
in uh, early 2005, the film's out there. You know, I get, and Scott never complained. Scott said, you treated, the funny thing is, Scott said we treated him fairly. Carl Flock said we treated him fairly. I've never had anybody I've interviewed in any film say I've treated them and their views unfairly. Yes. Even when, as in Do You Believe in Magic, Carl Flock sort of comes out sounding like the loser, if you will, in a debate with Stan Friedman. Um, but Carl said, look, no, you, you let me air my views and treated me fairly, no problem. So that's what I did with Aztec. Everybody got their say, fine. And then I got my say. Yeah. Uh, and some people in the UFO community can understand how you could make a film and then allegedly repudiate your film. Well, no, I don't repudiate the film. The film is what the film is. But it doesn't necessarily reflect, in this instance, my views. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to tell you what I think, having done my own research. And after the film was made, I went and did a lot more research on Aztec. And I came to conclusions that were that are completely pol polar opposite to what Scott Ramsey's conclusions are. Well, that's fine. You can read the materials, folks. There's my opinion. There's Scott's opinion. And decide for yourself which one is valid and which one isn't. But... Um, you know, to say I repudiated the film, or Majestic 12, the MJ-12 films, same thing. Paul's repudiated his film. There's a particular critic, uh, my number one fan, who seems to uh, spend most of his life now uh, blogging or writing or whatever about me, uh, which is flattering in a sense. My friends and I get endless hours of amusement from it. Um, but he says, Kimball has repudiated his film. Well, hogwash. I mean, that, that that's a lie. Uh, either it's a knowing lie or it's a lie through incompetence and ignorance. I haven't re about how filmmaking works. I haven't repudiated my films. I just turned Do You Believe in Magic over to Tim Crawford, who's probably going to sell hundreds of thousands of copies, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds or thousands <laughs> of copies. If I really repudiated the film, I would have stuck it in a hole somewhere and and said, no, nah, you know, I, nobody's ever going to see this again. Uh, so all, this film is going to go out there, and it's going to, it, by and large, presents Majestic 12 in a more favor favorable light than not. I don't agree with those conclusions anymore. Although in the film, I said that I gave them some weight. I've changed my mind. I did more research. Well, you know, so what? People can change their minds. But to say I've repudiated the films is, is one of the most asinine things you can possibly come up with. And when, when somebody says that, if you read somebody say that about me or anyone else, it has nothing to do with whether or not I repudiated the films. It has everything to do with that person's own agenda, and and that's what you should be looking for. So, no, nope, haven't repudiated any of the films. They're all good films in and of themselves. They tell the story they were meant to tell. Uh, do do I wish that I hadn't done them? No. Do I wish with Majestic 12 I'd done it differently? Yes. The one thing I would have changed about the MJ-12 film is I would have left my own narration out of it because even as I was doing it, Somewhere in the back of my mind, there was something telling me MJ-12 is, is bunk. But because Stan was the primary MJ-12 uh, supporter, I didn't feel inclined to be as critical, perhaps, as I should have been. And when you get into that kind of relationship where you're dealing with somebody you have a great deal of respect for, yeah, maybe I would have left my own narration out of it. Um, I don't repudiate the film at all. It gives both sides a fair shake and their, their say. But would I have done that one differently? Yeah, maybe. I might have done that one a little differently. But no regrets. Yeah, there you go. You know, you got to move on, right? Yeah. I just wish I made more money from them. That <laughs> no, that's that's a, a complaint of life, I think. Yeah. The thing about government funding is when they're putting in a ton of money, they, uh, they're they investors. It's not free money, by and large. So, yeah. um, you know, if people think filmmakers in Canada are taking huge profits from the sale of their film, uh, they're not. Uh, on the Do You Believe in Magic film, for instance, every copy sold, I'll probably receive somewhere between 7 to 10% of the uh, of the money made on it. A lot will go to the distributor, um, and the rest will go to the various government funding agencies to pay them back, So, and which is fair. But, you know, it's not this giant money-making cash cow. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? Well, yeah, you know, yeah. That kind of segues nicely uh, into uh, one of your favorite punching bags on uh, on the other side of truth that I want to talk to you about. Let's just get right into it. Uh, exopolitics. You're not really a fan of uh, that clique, I guess you could call it, in, in ufology. In a nutshell, why don't you just explain your take on the exopolitics um, movement that's going on in ufology today? Well, the first thing, Tim, is if you if you buy into the exopolitics movement, you've made the following conclusion, that extraterrestrial life is visiting Earth, that it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and that we should now set about trying to figure out how we should deal with them. I don't buy that conclusion. Ergo, I can't buy exopolitics. 
leaving everything else aside, I, to me, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is still that, a working hypothesis, perhaps more valid than some, perhaps less valid than others. But it's not proved beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't even think it's proved beyond on a civil standard of a balance of probabilities. Is it more likely than not? So that alone is enough to send me on the other side of whatever camp exists of exopolitics. Yeah. And if that was just, if that's all it was, then fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Stan thinks the extraterrestrial hypothesis is the extraterrestrial fact. Stan and I get along just fine. We can agree to disagree on that. What makes exopolitics, in my mind, um, more egregious uh, than just a simple disagreement over mo- whether maybe the ETH has been proved or not, mm-hmm. which reasonable people can disagree over, is the way exopolitics goes about doing what they do and the claims that they make and the evidence that they rely on, which is just, I mean, it's ludicrous. Uh, to them, the following people are credible witnesses. Bob Lazar, credible witness. Uh, William Cooper, who was a nut job in, in extremis, you know, <laughs> is a credible source and a credible witness. And the list goes on and on and on. These are people consistently cited by the exopolitics types uh, as credible witnesses that prove the case. Clifford Stone, there's another one. And you can talk to Kevin Randall if you want. Uh, he will, He's one of the best guys there is at piece by piece listing why Clifford Stone is not a credible witness in any way, shape, or form. So there. You know, it, it ticks me off both as a former lawyer or somebody trained in law to view evidence objectively, to know the difference between good evidence and bad evidence. It ticks me off as a historian. Same thing. For you to look at evidence and, and know what good evidence is and what bad evidence is. It just insults my intelligence. That's what exopolitics does. So that's why certainly in in and throughout most of 2005, I was, um, you know, I was one of the leading voices maybe of the anti-exopolitical movement. Not so much anymore, because frankly, I just don't care. Um, I've come to the belief that the exopolitics people are going to do what they're going to do. Fine. Nothing I say is going to dissuade them from doing that. They are in the true believer camp, so let them true believe. Uh, I suppose if you write enough stuff, you might be able to convince some people that maybe they should stay away from exopolitics. But I think they have a very small constituency, um, and I think the people that are going to wander into that constituency are going to wander in there anyway. Same kind of people who believe that David Icke with his the queen is a reptilian thing. Yeah. There's not much you're going to be able to say to people like that that are going to convince them otherwise. So, um, Fine. I've sort of uh, not made my peace with exopolitics. I still think it's all bunk. Um, and everything about the way they their approach, their methodology, everything is bunk. But, you know, what's the point about uh, spending hours and hours and hours of trying to refute? And I think a lot of other ufologists have come to the same conclusion. Kevin Randall, Brad Sparks, Stan Friedman on the UFO updates uh, for quite a while went after Michael Sala, you know, fairly vociferously, as did I in terms of arguing against his claims. And I think they finally just sort of went, well, what's the point anymore? I mean, we've made our case. He's made his case. If you're going to believe him, well, good for you. But, you know, that's, those aren't the people we want to talk to. Yeah. We want to talk to people who have, are open-minded but also ha- aren't so open-minded they let their mind fall out. And in the exopolitics camp, I think they're open-minded people who've let their minds fall out. And the Paul Hellyer story is, is a perfect example. That is one thing that, as a Canadian, still drives me whenever I hear Paul Hellyer, um, because he's a Canadian, former defense minister. And they latch on to Paul Hellyer when he came out and last year and said, look, I believe UFOs are real. They latched on to him as this huge, massive story. You could go on to the Jerry Pippin show or Coast to Coast, and you hear these people talking as if, well, it's all solved, isn't it? The former minister of national defense in Canada has come out and said UFOs are real. Wow, we Well, I admit that's a bit of a headline. And if Paul Hellyer had come out and said, while I was Minister of National Defense in the 60s, 40 years ago, I was made aware. I knew things. Here's what I knew. Documents existed. We had a program to investigate. Blah, blah, blah. I met an alien. Whatever. Well, that would be news. And and whatever my qualms about uh, sort of the career of Paul Hellyer, which is extremely checkered, as you can see from... And that goes to credibility, no matter how much people might not think it does. Um, I would have sat up and, and said, well, good. You must know where these documents are. Let's let's bring them out, or let's talk to these people that you talk to. Fine. No, what Paul Hellyer's statement was based on was he read Philip Corso's The Day After Roswell and became convinced 
from Phil Corso's The Day After Roswell, which on the list of books that are bunk, Corso's would be in the top 20, maybe the top 10. And that's what convinced Paul Hellyer, four years after he was the Minister of National Defense and apparently didn't think UFOs were terribly serious at that time, well, that convinced Paul Hellyer that, yeah, they really were real and uh, they're flying over our heads and we're building advanced weapon systems to destroy them and we're on the verge of intragalactic war number one or two or whatever, blah, 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 blah. And there's the Paul Hellyer story in a nutshell. And uh, I'm sorry, if that's if that's what your big revelation is, if that's what your big witness is, if that's what your big story is, then it's no wonder most people in the mainstream don't pay any attention to um, to ufology. It, and that's really the problem with exopolitics is stuff like that. Again, Tim, it comes down to you're only as strong as your weakest link. Yeah. And those folks get associated with serious people like Kevin Randall or Brad Sparks or Dick Hall. And it becomes much easier to dismiss Brad Sparks or Kevin Randall or Dick Hall if you can then say, well, you know, Dick Hall, he's in ufology, right? Well, so is this Michael Salah guy and Alfred Weber and Stephen Bassett. And they believe aliens are here in 45 different races and we have treaties with them and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, then people say, oh, really? Oh, well, no point in looking at that because that's goofy. Well, they're right. The, the exopolitics stuff is goofy, but the Dick Hall stuff isn't goofy. But they tend, you know, they can, they'll conflate the two. And that's the real problem with exopolitics. So the other problem, Tim, last word on exopolitics is even if all of that is true, think about it for a second. They go around, they, they talk about, we will become ambassadors for humanity <laughs> and stuff like that. I guarantee you that, and you can look at the way, uh, say, the Native American populations dealt with the Europeans when they came here. If you took the exopolitical model, what would have happened is each individual Native American would have been able to become an ambassador to the various European nations that were coming here, blah, 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 blah. No, what happened was the Europeans chose to deal, by and large, with the governments, if you will, of the various Native tribes. So you would deal with the chiefs of the Iroquois or the chiefs of the Maliseet or the Algonquin or the Huron. You didn't go deal with Joe Native, you know, who might be out fishing in a river somewhere. You dealt with the people who were already in charge. And if aliens were coming here, um, you know, judging by the way that pretty much all intelligent species seem to work, meaning us, uh, throughout history, I, I don't think that no matter how much Alfred Weber and, uh, and Stephen Bassett and Michael Fallon might want to draw up treaties and uh, protocols for contact with extraterrestrial beings and stuff, mm -hmm. I don't think that's how it's going to go down. Um, and the, the real irony is these are all people, by and large, who believe that the government is this huge oppressive entity that is stealing all our freedoms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if they're actually doing that, I've got news for you. As soon as the aliens come and make themselves known, the government will do that one, too. I mean, if they can get away with stealing your freedoms with everything else, what makes you think they're going to all of a sudden go, wow, you know what? I guess we'll let everybody just talk to the aliens and, and it'll be a nice, peaceful, happy Earth. We, so how, you know, it's how the logic is internally inconsistent with itself on so many levels that I've just decided it's funny now as opposed to something that really gets my dander up. So, you know, exopolitics, when I do look at it from time to time these days, is more a source of amusement than anything else. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things I do enjoy, I guess, or uh, like about the exopolitics movement is that it's sort of an activist uh, function. Um, what do you think of uh, ufology taking on an activist approach? Um, and do you think that's sort of like you sort of alluded to that you wouldn't really uh, dig that sort of thing, but what do you think of uh, that idea of ufology uh, taking on a more proactive type of attitude? Well, proactive to what? Um, the peace movement, uh, which is what exopolitics uh, to some degree gets tied into the anti anti ballistic missile movement, if you will, which in Canada is what uh, Alfred Weber and some of the others are linked to. Um, you know, what what do you want them to become proactive about? Because it seems the things that they want to become proactive with have nothing to do with UFOs, really, and the study of UFOs. They have to do with other things but I don't see how those things are necessarily related to UFOs, unless you really do believe the United States is putting anti-ballistic missile um, systems up into space and not turning them to face China and North Korea and Iran and whoever else might have nukes, but actually they're pointing outwards to the aliens. Well, again, if you believe that, you're lost to me. You and I have nothing to talk about because I think that's crazy. I know what those systems are up there for. They're pointing down here for good or ill. So if you disagree with ballistic missile defense, fine. But do so on the basis of you don't think you should have weapons in space pointing down at the Earth 
<laughs> as opposed to we disagree with ballistic missile defense because they're going to start World War or intergalactic War One with alien species that are up there. I mean, really, if the aliens can get from there to here, I have a strong suspicion that whatever weapons we can put up into space aren't really going to cause them very many problems. That's just a guess of mine. I'm just guessing. So, you know, in terms of the political, whatever kind of activism that they become involved in, I think that just further works to the detriment of the serious study of the UFO phenomenon. And frankly, I think it works to the detriment of the peace movement. Uh, and there are a number of chat, take, take, um, the sort of, in Canada, the, the, the left wing party is the New Democratic Party, mm -hmm. which, uh, sits on the left of the political spectrum. Most people, the, the real left, some of them the center left, but they're definitely the leftist party in Canada. They're all for, um, peace and disarm, generally speaking, disarmament and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And that's fine. They're definitely against ballistic missile defense. Well, if you go on to some of their chat rooms, when Paul Hellyer first came up in, in 2005 and started reading about, they, they actually became aware of Hellyer and this sort of Institute for Cooperation in Space, or whatever it is uh, Alfred Weber runs out there in um, Vancouver. Yeah. They weren't pleased <laughs> because they said the last thing, I paraphrase, the last, and I've talked to some friends of mine who are on the, the left, and I talked to them about this, and they said, look, would you want to be associated with uh, Ku Klux Klan if you're on the right? And I went, well, I'm not on the right, I'm in the center, but if I was on the right, I no, yeah. <laughs> because people know. And they said, well, we don't want to be associated with people who think when we are against ballistic missile defense and Canada's participation therein, we don't want to be associated with people on the far fringe who think that they're actually, the systems are up there pointing at aliens, because that just makes all of us look, again, Tim, the weakest link. And that's what people, your critics, will focus on. Yeah. And so, and in fact, when Hellier came out and Weber came out and they started talking about these things and linking the two, there were commentators in Canada who are in favor of ballistic missile defense who latched on to this mm -hmm. and used it as a way to try and discredit, uh, at least to some degree or another, and every little bit of discrediting helps if you're into that sort of thing, discredit the peace movement, discredit the people who are against the ballistic missile defense and Canada's participation in it. So I don't think they do anybody any good, either within ufology or the study of the UFO phenomenon for different reasons, or those things that they are looking at that they tie it to outside the study of the UFO phenomenon. And there are people within exopolitics, by the way, who are well-meaning, well-intentioned, sincere. I have nothing against them. Um, I have nothing against any of them, really. I just think they're, it, it's a horrible mistake that they're making. Uh, if they really believe in things like nuclear disarmament, the last thing I think you want to do is tie that to um, aliens, 45 or whatever alien races are visiting Earth and abducting a million humans a year or whatever else it is they believe in. I mean, you're just not adding any credibility to your cause. Um, so, yeah, I, the political activism of exopolitics, I, not only is it is it not doing any good, it's actually doing harm, I think, if you believe in those things that they're becoming active in. And if I was one of those people who believed in those things, and sometimes I am, that would that would annoy me. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. And well, then what, what sort of course do you think ufology should be going down instead of uh, trying to root out these whistleblowers and what have you? Uh, are you suggesting more of a science-based approach or, or, you know, what, what, where, where would you rather see, uh, the, the course of ufology go? No, don't get me wrong. I'm all for whistleblowers, as long as they're legitimate, credible whistleblowers. I prefer to call them witnesses. But, you know, um, sometimes even anonymous whistleblowers are necessary. If you really do believe the government's withholding information to some degree or another, you can expect that at least some of the people that come forward are going to be anonymous. What you have to do is treat those any anonymous claims with extreme caution. You need to assume that it's probably not true and work from that assumption and work your way towards it is true yeah. by vetting it carefully as opposed to the way some people seem to work at it. Well, this must be true, and we're actually not even really going to check to see if it isn't true. We're just going to assume it is. I don't think that does any good. But I'm not against whistleblowers. There are people out there. I've interviewed some of them, a number of them, including for best evidence, former military officers, for instance, who say, look, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me, this is our story. Charles Halt, former deputy base commander at uh, Bentwaters in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. the Rendlesham case. Yep. There's one example. Robert Salas, former uh, captain in the U.S. Air Force and was the deputy commander of a missile silo uh, base in, um, oh, where the heck was it, Malmstrom. 
uh, in, where's Miles from, North Dakota or Montana? I'm North sure. Dakota, I think. Pretty sure it's North Dakota. I can't remember off the top of my head. Anyway, the Malmstrom missile base case uh, is a really good case. And Salas, you know, I would assume that people you put in charge of your nuclear missile facilities are not complete morons and wackos. And I've talked to former Captain Salas, who also has a master's degree in education now, and a very bright guy, very nice guy, and uh, his story comes across as credible. Those are the people you should be talking to. Salas, by the way, was uh, part of Stephen Greer's disclosure project. He was uh, one of those 400 witnesses that are touted. Again, though, the weakest link. You have good witnesses like Salas telling credible stories that make you think, hmm, maybe there's something to all this. The problem is Greer mixed them in with a bunch of wackos. Yeah. So, again, with the weakest link theory, people will be inclined to dismiss all of them because they'll just say, well, look, you know, how credible can any of these people be when Joe Wacko over there is part of that group? And I think that was the, the colossal mistake that Dr. Greer made um, if you want to assume it was a mistake as opposed to intentional, uh, which I do. I think it was uh, just a mistake. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that the study of the UFO phenomenon doesn't need. If you want to get the public's attention, if you want to convince them of anything, just focus on the good witnesses. Vet them carefully because other people will vet them for you. It's like being a trial lawyer. You make sure you know not only the good things about your clients and your witnesses before you put them on a stand, or them on the stand, you make sure you know the bad things. What? You've been to a brothel? Ugh. Uh, that's not, you know, I might want to know that. Tell me everything. Even if you don't think it's relevant, I want to know. So you have to know the good with the bad. And so often in ufology, they don't actually vet the witnesses carefully enough to figure out what the bad is. And if you've got bad and it's significant bad, you drop the witness. No matter how good you might think the story is, no matter how uh, outrageously fantastic you think the story is, it's not worth it. Because there are good, legitimate stories from good, legitimate people out there. You don't need the ones that come with a whole load of baggage. Yeah. And and uh, exopolitics in particular, but ufology in general, has sometimes let some of the people with baggage sort of tarnish the people that don't have baggage. And I, I think that's been one of the biggest flaws of uh, sort of ufology which I sometimes differentiate from the serious study of UFOs, um, one of the biggest flaws of ufology over the years. So when a guy like Stan Friedman, for instance, goes out there and rips Bob Lazar a new one, you know, Stan says, hmm, Bob Lazar. Okay, that's a story. Uh, let's check into Bob Lazar. Well, Bob Lazar claims to have gone to this university and this university and held this job and blah, 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 blah. And Stan checks into it and the university says no and this university says no and, oh, you never worked there. Well, okay. Guess what? Bob Lazar is not a credible witness. And the answer to Stan's claims, the only answer they can come up with, the people who still support Lazar, is, well, the government erased all his files. Hogwash. The government, whatever you think of them, doesn't have the ability to erase everybody's files, even Bob Lazar's files, from his university. Mm -hmm. They can't do it. And even if they could, Bob Lazar would, or should, still have his degrees. So if Bob Lazar says he went to MIT... He should have his MIT degree. Somebody in his class should remember him. Who is? Who are your professors? Who are the other students? You must have had friends. We'll call them. The government couldn't have gotten to all of them. I mean, if you, if you want to check in, Stan's made this point, too. Stan says, look, I got my degrees hanging on the wall. I'm a member of the, I think it's the American Institute of Physicists or whatever. I have a card. Here it is. You can check. Yeah. Same here. You want to know if I went to law school or not? Call Dell. They'll tell you I went to Dalhousie Law School. Even if they won't. I'll tell you, because I have my yearbook, I have my degree, I have photos taken of me with other students, Mm -hmm. you know, I have friends you could call. The government can't get to all of them. So Bob Lazar is the poster child for how some people just won't accept what Carl Flock used to call the will to believe. He did it in reference to Roswell, but it's really apropos in reference to some of these so-called whistleblowers. How some people won't accept, even when a ufological legend like Stan Friedman goes out and debunks, because that's what he did, bad word, but debunking is good if it's bunk. You know, he debunks the Bob Lazar story, and there's still people who say, and exopolitics types are among those people, who say, well, you know, Lazar is credible. The government got to all these other people. Okay, you know, at that point, (laughs) you've just lost me. And I think you've lost 95%, and I'm being generous, of the population. And you're damaging everybody else within ufology who wants people to take it seriously. So, yeah, there you go. 
Yeah, you kind of, uh, I was listening to an interview with you uh, earlier today, and you said uh, that there's a fundamental mistake that started with Roswell and ufology that was sort of uh, where they jump on more sensational cases without doing uh, the vetting. Is that sort of what you're talking about there? Yeah, to a degree. I mean, Roswell is a terribly complex case, and it's become almost a cliche of a case in that everyone's positions, and you can see this on UFO updates right now, there's a thread going on as you and I talk about Jesse Marcel Jr. and whether his father, Major Jesse Marcel, actually brought wreckage, whatever that wreckage might have been, back to the home, whether the kid touched it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Fine. They're still arguing about all that stuff. Again, Roswell, very complex case. But if you read through all the evidence about Roswell, you realize a lot of the witnesses that for years were touted as good quality, credible witnesses were not. Good quality investigators should have known that far sooner than they did. I think Roswell was plagued from the get-go by amateurish investigation. And I say that knowing that two friends of mine, Stan Friedman and Kevin Randall, for whom I have a great deal of respect, were two of the primary investigators. I think Kevin and Stan have learned from the mistakes that they made during Roswell. That's one way you can learn. You don't. It's good if you have uh, training in oral research methodology and evidence and everything. That's wonderful. But you can also learn from doing. They learn from doing. I think uh, Kevin, in particular, would be the first to tell you that he learned a lot in the Roswell investigation, although you'd have to ask him. But Frank Kaufman, Kevin latched on to Frank Kaufman. Frank Kaufman has been totally discredited. To his credit, Kevin was one of the guys who came forward and helped do that because he continued to investigate. Glenn Dennis has been pretty much totally discredited. Kevin will tell you that. Um, Stan, I think, will tell you that, although maybe Stan still keeps Glenn in his gray basket. I don't know. Gerald Anderson, who the Plains of San Augustine story, totally discredited as a witness. And you can go down the list. Are there still credible witnesses? With Roswell, yes. Are a lot of them though have been discredited, or parts of their story have turned out to be not accurate, and the end result is that the whole Roswell thing has it's insolvable. It will never be solved to everyone's satisfaction. Nick Redfern brings his theory out, which I thought was very problematic, had a lot of flaws in it. Some people latch on to that. Great, that's the Roswell solution. Carl Flock came out with the Project Mogul explanation based on the, the military's explanation. Great. Some people look at that and go, right, Project Mogul. Stan still adheres to the crashed alien spacecraft explanation. Great. Some people buy into that. The problem is there's so much that has gone on in the last 25 years with Roswell. It'll never be solved. Yeah. People have, and it, it, it has become myth. It has become legend. And in 150 years or 200 years, if we're all, if our descendants are still here and still talking about Roswell at all, it's probably going to be in the same way that maybe we talk about Robin Hood. Because, and I'm not saying that what happened at Roswell was a myth. I'm saying that the way it's presented now, it's going to become a myth. Yeah. Because we'll never be able to get to the truth of it. In a large part because a lot of the investigation was mucked up and a lot of the witnesses that came out, you know, whether you discredit them now or not, the stories are there. They're ingrained, and there will always be some people who will never accept that maybe Frank Kaufman wasn't a real, real, really who he said he was, or Glenn Dennis is still telling the truth, and the government, again, has covered it all up. So whenever you're dealing with stuff like that, hmm. so it, my thing would have been, you know, maybe, maybe they should have been a little more careful with the Roswell case. I think Roswell is an a very important lesson to anyone who wants to investigate a UFO case from here on in, that there's a way to do it and there's a way to not do it. And in Roswell, you saw bits of both. And I think the most important thing we could take out of Roswell now, as I think it'll probably never be solved, is how should you conduct an investigation and how should you not conduct an investigation. So go back and look at how they did it, learn from their mistakes, do the things that they did right, do those things. But you know, that's the case with Roswell. And then, to some degree, it was the case with Rendlesham, too, um, and the case with a lot of these, these major UFO incidents. The investigation has not always been as good as it could have been, perhaps as good as the case warranted. You know, you, you know, it's, perhaps Roswell has been undone by the sometimes shoddy work of some of the investigators. And, and look at the investigators themselves. Don Schmidt, perfect example. Kevin's old writing partner. 
much to Kevin's chagrin now. You know, Don Schmidt is still lionized by some people. He's invited to speak at conferences. He uh, writes papers. Uh, I think he's still on the board of directors of the UFO Museum in Roswell, uh, or he's in their Hall of Fame or something like that. Don Schmidt was completely discredited because Don Schmidt was not truthful about his own background in significant ways. And I, I feel really bad for Kevin because he gets burned. He's a trusting guy. He gets burned by Schmidt. I mean, the, that's the kind of stuff that just makes the Roswell case unsolvable. Um, there's just so much. You'll never be able to get to the nuts of it because there's so much grease all over the thing. Yeah. So, do you uh, think? Do you think that's a result of a rush to, uh, like a rush to, uh, pardon the expression, but like a rush to publish, or uh, like to be first with the story and then you end up uh, not producing good enough investigation? Or that the people doing the investigations are, uh, I don't want to, like, say amateur, but amateurs, you know, in a sense that this is an amateur sort of science. Well, yeah, I'll go with the last one. Um, was there a rush to publication in, in the case of Roswell? Maybe, with the first book, The Roswell Incident. By the way, Stan got screwed on that. Stan's name should have been on that book as a co-author, and it wasn't, um, because Stan did the vast majority of the research into that. So... Yeah, with the Roswell incident rushed out, yeah, it's a, it's a lousy book. It's um, it's a very slim volume. It's like a bad UFO film. A lot of it relies on stuff that was already in the public domain. And I think when they put the book out, they hoped that more people, you know, would come forward. The problem is, like, yeah, lots of people came forward. Not all of them credible. I think the biggest problem in ufology is the the quality of the investigators. And, yeah, you know, people are going to think, oh, well, there's Kimball again just um, ragging on all these people. Nope. Far from it. I think they all mean well, by and large. But, again, as with making films, you have to understand not everybody is a good interviewer. Not everybody is a good document researcher. There are reasons why people go to university and get degrees in things like oral research methodology. I've taken courses in it when I was doing my master's in history. You know, there's and certainly in law school you do. There, there is a skill set required. There is a, a way you're supposed to ask questions. If you go into a court of law and start asking leading questions, you know the, the other lawyer or the judge will slap you down. Yeah. So there's a reason for that. Leading questions are bad, you know, <laughs> by and large, because they tend to put answers in people's mouths as opposed to getting what the person would actually say. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people within ufology, I think, ask leading questions. I think if you read interview transcripts, you'll see uh, that that's often the case. So that's one problem. Um, you know, a lot of these people wind up talking about things like the national security system and cla the classification of documents and all that sort of stuff, and they know nothing about it. They've never done any research with it. They've never worked under it, as Stan has. Stan has worked under security, did for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So when Stan talks about security, even if I disagree with his conclusions, I respect what he says. Yeah. Kevin Randall, same thing. Guy's an intelligence officer. He still works under security in the military. I respect his opinion, even if I don't agree with his conclusions. But at least I know he knows what he's talking about, by and large. But a lot of people don't. The truth is, you can probably count on two hands the number of quality UFO investigators and researchers there are out there today. Maybe four hands. You know, but it's a small number. Maybe a dozen or two dozen of quality researchers yeah. who, who do good work. The rest of them, it's, it's just noise. And, uh, and they mean well, but they're probably doing more harm than good. And, uh, and that's the, that's the uncomfortable truth, but I think it is the truth. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Didn't I tell you before when we weren't on the air that I said I wasn't going to say anything mean about anyone? I don't mean it to be mean. It's like having to take castor oil or whatever, you know, some medicine that you don't want to take. But ufology needs to take, let me rephrase. Ufology doesn't need to. I think ufology is a lost cause. I think in the sense of the serious study of the UFO phenomenon. I think ufology exists as a social phenomenon, um, as a club or a network of like-minded people who are interested in the subject. That's fine. But that needs to be differentiated from the serious research into the UFO phenomenon because I think the UFO phenomenon warrants serious research, serious scientific research, serious historical research, serious um, even legal research in terms of some of the legal ramifications, maybe take the Cash Landrum case. Most people don't think that the Cash Landrum case was an was a alien spacecraft. They think it might have been a government yeah. top-secret project that caused an illness to these people. That's 
something that lawyers and legal investigators and police and those kind of people need to get involved in. Because some UFO cases, maybe all of them, I don't know, could have nothing to do with aliens, but might have something to do with a more terrestrial phenomenon that we might want to become concerned with. In a legal sense, people have rights. If you're violating their rights for whatever reason or through negligence, that's something you should be looking into. But I think that is different than what ufology is doing. I think ufology, there is no... All of the... Take scientific research. Kevin Randall's made this point over and over and over again. To conduct real scientific research, you need peer review. Two questions arise from that. Who would your peers be in ufology? Yeah. Really, small list. But how would you go about doing that? Well, Kevin tried. Kevin wrote a paper on the Mantell incident, I think, three years ago. Had the paper published, well, published, put up on UFO Updates. It's still sitting on the UFO Updates website. There it is. Kevin said, I'm going to write this paper on the Mantell incident. I want feedback. Like, you are my peers. So give me feedback. You can go on the UFO Updates. I don't think you get a single response publicly. I don't think anybody responded to that, to that with comments. Certainly not the kind of detailed critique you would expect from peer review. Yeah. You, again, you'd have to ask Kevin, who would be a great guy, by the way, to be interviewed on Banal of America, and, um, and see whether he got private responses. I did ask him that once. I can't remember his exact answer, but I don't think he got very many. Again, there it is. Guy takes all that time to put the paper together, puts it out there, doesn't really get much of a response. Certainly not the kind of peer review you need to get people to take you seriously. And to really vet Kevin's, you know, Kevin puts it out there. I think he wanted feedback, like, okay, Kevin, these three things are right. That's wrong, and here's why. Kevin will go, oh, okay, that's how it works, folks. Peer review. People say, okay, you're right, 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 but you're wrong over there, and here's why. Oh, and then the person who is allegedly wrong would go, well, I don't think I'm wrong. Here's where I think you're wrong. And then back and forth, and eventually... You know, that sort of peer concept, you, you come up with a consensus, if you will. And consensus is a good thing. And maybe consensus isn't what UFO true believers want. Because consensus usually takes a few steps back and says, all we're really concerned with are the things that we can pretty much all agree are true, a fact. Yeah. And the true, the true believers, they're not interested in that. What they're interested in are things that will validate their belief. So if you come to them and you say, we can show the fact A, B, C, D, and E, but that doesn't prove what you believe. But, you know, it's, those are the facts, yeah. and let's go from there. They'll say, we knew A, B, C, D, and E were real. We also knew F through Z are real, which you just said probably aren't or at least can't be proven. So we accept A through Z, and that leads us to our belief. And by the way. It, it validates everything we believe in. You're far too cautious. You're taking two steps back and one step to the side. You know, you're really stealth debunkers, whatever. The, you know, they come up with so many different things to say, when in fact that's all you're engaging in is objective, serious research. But if you're a true believer, you don't want objective, serious research because that objective, serious research might lead to conclusions that don't jive with your own. Again, I don't have a lot of time for those people. I'm sure they mean well, but to me, that's like arguing with evangelical Christians. It's, you know, they did a project, the, uh, I think it was the Jesus Seminar, where they went through the Bible, religious scholars, and said, here's what we think Jesus said. We, we're sure Jesus said this. We're sort of sure he might have said this, and we're pretty sure he didn't say that. And they went through the entire New Testament, bing, 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 bing. And I think they color-coded the whole thing. So if it's in green, Jesus said it. If it's in red, Jesus didn't say it. Mm -hmm. Most evangelical Christians went, ah! <laughs> you know, the entire thing is the Word of God. He said it all. But they looked at um, objective historical evidence. They cross-referenced things. They went engaged in peer review. And that's what they came forward with. Did it make evangelicals happy? No. Was it probably as close as you can get to the historical truth? Yeah at the time. Uf ufology goes through the same thing. Yeah. If you did that, you'd have, here are things that we can prove. These are facts. Those are in green. Here are the things that, yeah, maybe. And that's probably, Stan would call it his gray basket. Yeah. That's probably a great group in the center. But we shouldn't be using that as evidence because we can't prove it. So it's there. It's interesting, but we can't prove it. More research maybe needs to be done. And then there's the stuff, look, we can't, not only can't we prove it, we can prove it's false. Didn't happen. Fine. Serious UFO researchers engage in that kind of process. The true believers say, as the evangelical Christians would, and again, I wish no ill will, but they say, you know what? This is hooey. <laughs> it's all green. It's all true. 
And, and I think that's the difference. Ufology has too many true believers in it to probably save it as the mechanism for the serious study of the UFO phenomenon. Uh, although it serves other purposes, um, so many of which are legitimate. I think the serious study of the UFO phenomenon is going to have to take place in another form. It's going to be a form that's probably going to include some people who are in ufology now, guys like Kevin Randall, but they're going to have to, if you really wanted to move it forward, Tim, you, you would sort of in some sense have to disassociate yourself with a lot of these elements in ufology and and move into another another realm and not worry about whether the believers call you a skeptic monkey or a, a debunker or whatever. Just yeah. ignore them and start trying to deal with science and historians and get them interested. Let's talk about your uh, big symposium coming up. It's the 2006 New Frontiers Symposium, October 14, 2006, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, you've got seven big name speakers going to be there. Tell me about the speakers. Tell me about this symposium. Tell me all about it. I've got six big name speakers and me. Yeah, well, I included yeah, you. I do. Well, thanks very much, but I, I don't consider myself a big name speaker. Okay. But I come cheap. So. <laughs> uh, let's see. Who's on the list? Stan Friedman talking about flying saucers and physics. Uh, Greg Bishop will be talking about the contact team movement, a historical overview of uh, Adamski and those guys. Will Wise will be talking about uh, the Project Blue Book archive. We'll be talking about Project Blue Book. Mm -hmm. Mac Tonys will be there, and Mac doesn't speak at a lot of conferences. He should, but he hasn't been invited. So Mac will be speaking about um, a post-human future, and he'll be talking about things like transhumanism, post-humanism. So not really, not necessarily UFOs, but something that is coming faster, I think, than we think maybe it is. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Nick Redfern has just been added. He'll be talking about strange creatures. So, again, not necessarily UFOs, but the symposium's tagline is extraterrestrial life, space exploration, and the future. And I think, you know, you don't want to focus just on UFOs. Yeah. So I wanted to broaden it out. Um, and by broadening it out, Robert Zimmerman, Bob Zimmerman, will be talking about space stories, uh, astronauts exploring in space, and some really cool space stories that highlight the courage and the ingenuity of the American space program. And for all I know, we'll be talking about the Russian space program, too. I don't know. Uh, and he's the author of Leaving Earth, as I mentioned before. Um, and I'll be talking about best evidence, some of the top cases. I'll probably pick three or four of the top cases and talk about them. So, you know, 15 minutes on each case. I can guarantee you the RB47 case will be one of them. So I, I criticized about a year and a half ago when I first started my blog a lot of UFO conferences. I said, you're inviting crazy speakers, the wackos. You're only appealing to the um, committed, the ones, you know, you're preaching to the choir, as it were. Yeah. You, should, you should run. The way to run a UFO conference is to bring in serious speakers talking about serious subjects. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, put your money where your mouth is. So I am. A lot of it. It's, you know, not a cheap endeavor to put a conference together. Yeah. So I think I'm bringing in six serious guys talking about six serious subjects in a serious way, including cryptozoology, Nick, and cryptozoology. Yeah. Um, and hopefully people will come. I'm keeping the fees down, so I think the if you're an adult, the whole day is 50 bucks, or you can come see one session for 20 or something like that. Students, I'm giving a cut rate for students, so the whole day is only $30. So six really great speakers and me and, for uh, thirty bucks. And what's the uh, what's the you got a URL for that? Yeah, uh, www.halifaxufo.com. H A L I F A X uh, UFO dot com. And it's being held at St. Mary's University, uh, the McNally Auditorium, which is a wonderful facility. So hopefully, um, SMU has a student population of, I think, close to 10,000, and it's right next door to Dalhousie University, which has a population of about 15,000. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, a lot of students will come down. Again, as you and I talked about, trying to encourage younger people yeah. to come. And that's why, you know, if you look at that list of speakers, Nick, Greg, Mac, and Will Wise were four of the ten guys I picked as my generation now, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to make sure that they were, and you know, I'm only 39, so I I wouldn't put myself on that list, but I'm in that younger, under 40 group, too. And then you've got, but tip of that, the Stan, the uh, ufologist emeritus as well. Yeah. So he'll be there as the icon, and then the rest of us will be there, hopefully maybe as the next generation of people uh, who try and get people to take UFOs seriously. Awesome. It sounds like a great time. Yeah, well, you know, it's a cheap flight to Halifax from Boston, New York, or Washington, so 
relatively speaking. Yeah, I know. Well, I've, also, I've often uh, said there's not enough UFO conferences on the East Coast. Uh, I think actually we had a discussion about this on the uh, on our message board, the Normal American message board. Um, yeah. So it's always good to see that there's uh, going to be something on the East Coast. I'm going to try and, depending on what my situation is here in Boston in October, uh, if I'm still around, I'll try and make the trip up to Nova Scotia. I'll tell you what, Tim, if you come up, you get in for free, which, oh. you know, really only saves you about 30 or 50 bucks, but still. Hey. Yeah, Tim Vidal is in for free. Awesome. Now, what and about uh, Veronica Reynolds? Is she going to be there? She will, yes. In fact, uh, I'm hoping, <laughs> I haven't talked to her lately, but I'm hoping Veronica might actually be the host in the sense of introducing everybody. Oh, wow. So I, I do intend to ask her to do that, and um, that will be following on the heels of her uh, major film debut in Trailer Park Boys, the uh, new Trailer Park Boys movie, which is produced by Ivan Reitman, comes out sometime in the fall. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah Veronica. I'll be, you have read my blog there. Yes, yes. I, well, I wanted to throw that in there because I, uh, as I was reading the blog and she came up an awful lot and uh, I figured if I mentioned that it would probably be enjoyable to all the fans of uh, The Other Side of Truth. Yeah, she's a good friend of mine and, um, and uh, she's a good person and she actually has an interest in UFOs has a sighting. She actually had a sighting when she was younger of a UFO, which I never have. Stan has never had. So she's in an even in a different category. So yeah, you know, people take UFOs seriously. A lot of my friends do too. They just probably wouldn't admit it. Yeah. Um, and I think the trick is to create a, a environment, a field, an environment where people aren't afraid to admit it for whatever reason, yeah. ridicule or being attacked or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything else up on the horizon that we should know about uh, that you want to talk about? Uh, no, no, I believe me, I think if your listeners are still listening to him, I probably bored them to death or enraged them, um, which is a tremendous combination to be able to bore somebody as you're enraging them. So, well, yeah. Um, so I've, I've, yeah, I've hit everything that I could possibly talk about. Awesome. Well, let, let me throw in the, uh, the websites here uh, for all the listeners here who want to check out your writing. Like I said, the blog is amazing. It's got tons of stuff on there. And like you said, uh, it may infuriate you, but hopefully it'll get you to think. Uh, the blog address is redstarfilms.blogspot.com. And the conference is 2006 New Frontiers Symposium, October 14th, 2006, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And one more time, what's the URL for that? Um, Halifax UFO, H-A-L-I-F-A-X U-F-O dot com. And the conference is... 2006 New Frontiers Symposium, October 14th, 2006, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And one more time, what's the URL for that? Um, Halifax UFO, H A L I F A X U F O dot com. That does it for this week's edition of Been All of America Audio. I want to thank Paul Kimball for sitting down and talking to us for so long. Don't forget, he's got the big symposium coming up this weekend, October 14th, 2006, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Great lineup of speakers. It sounds like it's going to be an awesome time. HalifaxUFO.com. That's where you can find out more information about it. I also want to thank Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Ralph Molesworth, and Joe V. of BenAllOfAmerica.com for your help and support with the audio series. BenAllOfAmerica.com is not just the audio show, folks. It's daily updates. It's weekly columns from Chiron and Leslie. It's bi-weekly columns from R. Lee. It's fantastic stuff in the archive from Joe V. and Ralph Molesworth. Definitely check out what we've got on tap at BenAllOfAmerica.com. Make it a part of your everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. While we're doling out the big thanks, let me thank also some of the websites that have helped us get the word out on Ben All of America Audio. TheDailyGrail.com, TheAnomalous.com, UFOReview.net, WinterSteel.com, and RedIce.net. Those websites have been crucial in spreading the word on Ben All of America Audio. Chances are, if you're listening to this show, you very well may have heard about it through one of those great websites. I use them daily to find out what's going on in Esoterica. You definitely should check them out as well. If you're a long-time Ben All of America Audio listener and you want to help out with the audio series, click the PayPal button at BenAllOfAmerica.com. Make a donation. We would definitely appreciate any support we can get. Next week, if you thought this week's edition of Ben All of America Audio was wild, wait till you get a load of what we have on tap for you next week. Paul and I continue our discussion on ufology, some of the problems of ufology, why young people don't seem to be gravitating towards ufology. We talk about ufology on the internet, Paul's future films, and just tons of other stuff. If you liked this week's installment or if you were infuriated by it, you're going to want to come back and hear what else Paul has to say about ufology and the UFO phenomenon in general. 
That, of course, will be airing next week at BenAllOfAmerica.com, October 14th, 2006. Until you hear from me then, ladies and gentlemen, this is Tim Benall, signing off.